That's just a thing I do. Like, I've just made it a fight between me and Joe Mohawk to try and, like, see who gets that opening spot, that first, like, five seconds. Hey, when I'm not you, G, go cool! And this is the final episode of the Ruby Report, Volume 4. <laughs> Hello everybody, it's your man Jomahawk 2694, and I'm here with Django Fed 23 with episode 12 of volume 4 of the Ruby Report, entitled No Safe Haven. This episode doesn't waste any time. It's nearly half an hour long and it doesn't waste any time off the bat. I thought so many bad things were gonna happen. It tugged at my heartstrings a few times. I thought Nora was gonna die a few times. I thought Lyrin was gonna die a few times. I thought Crow was gonna die a few times. Hell, there was a moment where I even thought maybe Ruby was gonna die. First scene is the Nukalave kicking the crap out of Team Ranger. There's really not much I can really say detail-wise other than this thing kicking the ever-living crap out of Team Ranger. It basically just throws all four of them, and everyone falls on their face except for Lyren, who just has this cool spiral background. And basically this thing is twitching, and oh, like Jomahawk said, like a freaking twisted marionette, and then it just looks at them. We see how this thing fights. It's got Gumby arms. And then it just looks at them. And then it turns and looks at Crow. John notices this and starts running towards Crow. And then he finally gets to Crow. This thing's about to attack John and Crow. And then Lai Rin puts his hand to the ground and activates his semblance, which is not courage. He's not fucking Link. His color's pink, not green. He may wear green, but his color is pink. And he's proud of it. So maybe it isn't courage, but it's definitely some kind of camouflage. Their color fades, and their presence is basically a race. This Grim is standing right in front of them, and it can't see them. At least sight and sense-wise. Long enough for Jean to get Crow behind a building so he's out of dodge. John then puts his sword back into its sheath and pushes a button. Then pulls it out with the sheath on and it turns into a two-handed broadsword. Which seemed to cause a lot more pain to the nightmare fuel grim. And this thing looks beautiful. I love Jean's weapon. I love the simplicity and they took that simplicity and they added to it. They didn't give it some outrageous transformation. They gave it a simple transformation. The shield turns a shield sheath turns into a bladed broadsword. That makes sense. What are you doing? Twitchy McHorse Creep at one point ends up grabbing Ren and slamming him into a building. And everybody in the fandom is thinking, oh god, this is where one of them dies. Nora sees this, runs to protect him, and right when his second hand stretches to go hit Lyren, we just see Nora jump in front. And then it and then the, the screen turns black, and my heart sank to the bottom of my fucking ass. I thought this was the moment Nora was gonna die. I was literally about to shit a brick. I was gonna shit an entire brick house. Nora jumps in the way and ends up caught on the building herself, dangling from Maganil. We see from Lyren's perspective, he looks up, he sees Nora. She's just hanging there. Stop looking. Duh. This scene made me know that neither Lyren nor Nora were gonna die this episode. Because Lyren looks up, is happy Nora's there. Nora looks down, happy to see Lyren. And then Nora goes, don't look! Because Lyren was staring at her panties. And then Nora turns, and then she starts to smile like the minx she is. <laughs> Leave it to Ruby to manage to put a joke in the middle of a life or death fight. And immediately pulls her legs up closer to herself. Which was not a scene I was expecting out of Ruby. Ren ended up losing his shit once this thing tossed Nora aside and almost got himself killed in the process, only to have Nora drag him under a building and stop him from going out again and slapping him to make him come back to his senses. So then that leaves 
Jean and Ruby to take care of this beast while they're under the house having a couple's argument. That's when Nora bitch slaps him. Delta, play the clip in your own usual fashion. Make a tune out of it. And, uh, it's about to smash into the house, the Nukulave is, but Jean saves the day, stopping it with his sword. So anyone who says Jean is not a viable part of Team Ranger, anyone who says Jean is not a good fighter, you can go to hell! So then, they come up with a plan. Jean and Ruby will deal with the arms, Nora will deal with the horse, and Ren will deal with everything else, because he's pulled his father's knife out of his boot. So Ruby pins down one of the thing's arms, and Jean does the same with help from Ren, slamming it and pinning it to the ground with Jean's shield for him to be able to pin the arm down. And then Nora, from the top of the tallest tower, falls down and delivers... With the force of a thousand Thors, her almighty boop, and crushes the horse head through the pavement. So now this thing is in agony. Its head is whipping around. It's screaming right in Ren's face, and he's just looking at it like, you don't have any power over me anymore. He flips his nut father's knife in his hand and says, for my mother, slice one arm. For my father, slice the other arm. For everyone you've slain, slice right across the throat. For myself. Grabs it by the horn, and with his best Eddie Riggs, decapitation! That's the essence of this show right here. So, the thing turns into smoke. The battle is won. The beast that has slain thousands, killed by four huntsmen with heart. Ruby goes to check on Crow, who's still alive, and then a couple of airships from Mistral land and pick them up. And John asks on the airship, how did you find us out here? And the guy's like, we were on patrol and saw the smoke and know that knew that nobody had been out here for years, which meant there was probably something going on. And then we get our first view of the city of Mistral, and it's an idyllic-looking sort of mountain village. And we cut to the inside of a hotel where Crow is sleeping, and he's all right. Crow is okay. So Tyrion, you failed twice, bitch. Ruby then sits down, starts writing a letter with a fountain pen, and apparently her penmanship has gotten a lot better since the Volume 3 finale. And she starts writing a letter to Yang, saying a bunch of inspirational stuff, and she even manages to sneak in Monty's catchphrase. She says, We've all lost something, but if we gave up every time we'd lost, we'd never move forward. And we start cutting to the other members of the show. We see that Weiss has paid off an Atlas pilot to smuggle her out of the country and did cargo hold of his airship. Blake is going through her old chest of stuff and she pulls up a current White Fang flag before exchanging it for a old White Fang flag and remembering what it is she's fighting for. Yang has yet another new outfit and it is freaking amazing. She's wearing her aviators again, which is great. And uh, everything is looking good. Um, I don't remember everything Ruby said in her note, but she was basically saying to Yang, you were right to say it was reckless of me to go. There have been so many scary things that weren't just the grim, but I'm still doing this. I'm still moving forward. I'm still doing whatever I can to help. So were Jean, Ren, and Nora. And she said, we also met Uncle Crow, who told us a couple of things that I can't be sure will reach you in this letter. Because, you know, handwritten stuff isn't the best, the most reliable thing, but it's all they've got. If you joined us, we'd be able to tell you in person. And uh, we then get a little exposition for next volume that uh, Crow is going to take the four of them to meet Professor Lionheart, the head of Haven Academy in Mistral. And she just really hopes to rebuild Team Ruby. We see Yang get off the ship, the same ship that Blake was on, and uh, she gets to that same sign that says Mistral to the right, Curiuri to the left, and now it's been written over with the word bandits. I wonder who wrote that, because I'm not sure Ruby went all the way, backtracked all the way back and wrote bandits on it. So this had to be somebody else who wrote it. And Yang, on her bike, is like, 
You are in so much trouble when I find you. Uh, we see a flash of Ilya and those two white fang douchebags from Menagerie, and she obviously, you know, is under them because she bows to them. And then we see Cinder training some more, and yes, I'm glad about this. She snaps her fingers, and Emerald makes a mental image of Ruby appear, helpless on the ground, going, please, and then Cinder torches it. So yes... Cinder is still fully evil. And you know what? I'm happy. I don't want any of the bad guys to have a redemption arc. None. I want them all to suffer. Call me an asshole if you want. That's what I want. I want Cinder to look into Ruby's eyes as she dies. And for the maiden power to pass on to Emerald just in time for Jean to slice that mint-headed bitch's head off. So, Ruby ends her note saying, P.S. I'll give you my address of where we're staying in Mistral. Which could be a good or a bad thing, depending on who gets the letter. We also saw Oscar on a train leading into Mistral. Which makes me wonder, why the hell didn't Ruby and Team Ranger do that? Why did they walk the whole way instead of take a train? I mean, obviously we wouldn't have gotten the volume. That's the answer, is that we wouldn't have gotten a volume. We wouldn't have gotten this Nukalave fight. But still, why didn't they take a train? Anyway, we're in Professor Lionheart's office. We see the tea set that Oscar thought about. And then we hear somebody go, you know, Professor Lionheart <laughs> said, always said you were very hospitable. Remember... What Salem told Dr. Watts to do. Dr. Watts, you are to take Cinder's place and meet with our informant in Mistral. Very good. Which makes me think that their contact in Mistral is Professor Lionheart. So this is like bossing say all over again. <sighs> then we get a badass, uh, we get a badass, uh, song from Casey Lee Williams to go along with the final credits of the volume. It's not slow, it's not melodious, it's a hard rock song saying, we're back, we're not gonna stop. You had us down, but now we're back. And then the after credit scene. We see Crow in a bar. Guess he has a lot of drinking to make up for. And Oscar walks in, and uh, Crow's like, I don't think they serve kids here. And Oscar looks down and he's like, shut up, I'm getting to that. I'm supposed to tell you, I'd like my cane back. And Crow realizes what he's talk who he's talking to. And he pulls out the cane, just the handle part of it, throws it to Oscar, who grabs it, and the cane extends out. And Crow's like, It's good to see you again, Oz. And the volume ends. Theory! I believe that whichever one of the four relics was being guarded under Beacon is in the top of Ozpin's cane, a la the mosquito in the top of the dude's cane in Jurassic Park. So next up is Ruby Chibi Volume 2, which will hopefully take us all the way back to Volume 5. All in all, this was a pretty good volume. Had a lot of good revelations, had a lot of good backstory, had a lot of good, uh world building, and I, for one, definitely enjoyed the tone shift, the uh, the animation shift from the old style to this new style. I definitely like this new style. From what I've heard from Delta and Joma, Ruby Chibi will be starting back up in May, and I'm sure we're going to be going back to reactions for that. Can't wait for that. Volume 5 is going to be in the fall, um, so we'll see what happens when that comes out. And I'm pretty sure I'm running out of time on my phone, so this is until... Our ne the next video, this is Django Fett 23 saying good. I'm Natsuji Goku. This is my sword, Ventraquil. And we say subscribe, comment, and like. This has been the Ruby Reports Final Volume 4 Review. Goodbye. Oh, one more thing. Joma Hawk. Tiny nudge. Tiny nudges. Whenever, until next time, this is Lucario. 
This is Doom Guy. This is a Pit Boy. And all of us here at Super Kame Anime would like to say thank you for your patronage. Thank you for your subscriptions. Give us a shout out to your friends. And please, please continue to fight for the light. Rest in peace, Monty. You beautiful, beautiful bastard. See ya! Cops! Can you arrest people quieter? I'm sorry I'm going a little fast. The battery in the camera is about to die. Sorry, everyone. Like he's goddamn Monkey D. Luffy who ate the gummo gummo no me. Now, a happy ending. We got a happy ending. Nobody died. This kind of lends credence to Nora going gray in at the first episode of Volume 3 now. Uh, when she's going crazy. I think Ren might have been trying to calm her down. I had this really screwed up thought in the back of my mind that the end credit scene was going to be Salem or Salem and Cinder walking into a room with where they're holding Pyrrha if she's not actually dead, which I pray Pyrrha is not dead. There's no way she's dead. I hope she's not dead. Please, Rooster Teeth, don't let Pyrrha be dead.